Chapter One of Falcons of Narabedla. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mark Nelson. Falcons of Narabedla by Marion Zimmer Bradley. Chapter One Voltage from Nowhere. Somewhere on the crags above us I heard a big bird scream. I turned to Andy, knee-deep in the icy stream beside me. "'There's your eagle. Probably smells that cougar I shot yesterday.' I started to reel in my line, knowing what my brother's next move would be. "'Get the camera, and we'll try for a picture.' We crouched together in the underbrush, watching, as the big bird of prey wheeled down in a slow spiral toward the dead cougar. Andy was trembling with excitement the camera poised against his chest, his eyes glued in the image-finder. "'Golly!' he whispered, almost prayerfully. Six-foot wing spread, maybe more!' The bird screamed again, warily, head cocked into the wind. We were to leeward. The scent of the carrion masked our enemy smell from him. The eagle failed to scent or to see us, swooping down and dropping on the cougar's head. Andy's camera clicked twice the eagle thrust in its beak. A red-hot wire flared in my brain. The bird! The bird! I leaped out of cover, running swiftly across the ten-foot clearing that separated us from the attacking eagle, my hand tugging automatically at the hunting knife in my belt. Andy's shout of surprised anger was a faraway noise in my ears as the eagle started away with flapping, angry wings, then in fury swept down at me pinions beating around my head. I heard and felt the wicked beak dart in, and thrust blindly upward with the knife, ripped, slashing, hearing the bird's scream of pain and the flapping of wide wings. A red haze spun around me. Then the screaming eagle was gone, and Andy's angry grip was on my shoulder, shaking me roughly. His voice, furious and frightened, was hardly recognizable. Mike. Mike, you darned idiot! Are you all right? You must be crazy!" I blinked, rubbing my hand across my eyes. The hand came away wet. I was standing in the clearing, the knife in my hand red with blood. Bird blood. I heard myself ask, stupidly, "'What happened?' My brother's face came clear out of the thickness in my mind, scowling wrathfully. "'You tell me what happened. Mike, what in the devil were you thinking about? You told me yourself that an eagle will attack a man if he's bothered. I had him square in the camera when you jumped out of there like a bat out of a belfry and went for the eagle with your knife. You must be clean crazy." I let the knife drop out of my hand. "'Yeah,' I said heavily. "'Yeah, I guess I spoiled your picture, Andy. I'm sorry. I didn't—' My voice trailed off, helpless. The boy's hand was still on my shoulder. He let it drop and knelt in the grass, groping there for his camera. "'That's all right, Mike,' he said in a dead voice. "'You scared the daylights out of me, that's all.' He stood up swiftly, looking straight into my face. "'Darn it, Mike, you've been acting crazy for a week. I don't mind the blamed camera, but when you start going for eagles with your bare hands—' Abruptly he flung the camera away, turned and began to run down the slope in the direction of the cabin. I took a step to follow, then stopped, bending to retrieve the broken pieces of Andy's cherished camera. The kid must have hit the eagle with it. Lucky thing for me, an eagle can be a mean bird. But why, why in the living hell had I done a thing like that? I'd warned Andy time and time again to stay clear of the big birds. Now that the urgency of action had deserted me, I felt stupid and a little light-headed. I didn't wonder Andy thought I was crazy. I thought so myself more than half the time. I stowed the broken camera in my tackle-box, mentally promising Andy a better one, hunted up the abandoned lines and poles, carefully stowed them, cleaned our day's catch. It was dark before I started for the cabin. I could hear the hum of the electrodynamo I'd rigged up and see the electric light across the dusk of the Sierras. 
a smell of bacon greeted me as I crossed into the glare of the unshielded bulb. Andy was standing at the cook-stove, his back stubbornly to me. He did not turn. "'Andy,' I said. "'It's okay, Mike. Sit down and eat your supper. I didn't wait for the fish. Andy, I'll get you another camera. I said it's okay. Now damn it, eat." He didn't speak again for a long time, but as I stretched back for a second mug of coffee, he got up and began to walk around the room restlessly. "'Mike,' he said entreatingly, "'you came here for a rest. Why can't you lay off your everlasting work for a while and relax?' He looked disgustedly over his shoulder at the work-table where the light spilled over a confused litter of wires and magnets and coils. "'You've turned this place into a branch office of General Electric.' "'I can't stop now,' I said violently. "'I'm on the track of something, and if I stop I'll never find it.' "'Must be real important,' Andy said sourly. "'If it makes you act like bug-house bait.' I shrugged without answering. We'd been over that before. I'd known it when they threw me out of the government lab, just after the big blow-up. I thought, angrily, I'm heading for another one, but I don't care. Sit down, Andy, I told him. You don't know what happened down there. Now that the war's over, it's no military secret, and I'll tell you what happened. I paused, swallowing down the coffee, not knowing that it scalded my mouth. That is, I will if I can. Six months before they settled the war in Korea, I was working in a government radio lab on some new communications equipment. Since I never finished it, there's no point in going into details. It's enough to say it would have made radar as obsolete as the stagecoach. I'd built a special supersonic condenser, and had had trouble with a set of magnetic coils that wouldn't wind properly. When the thing blew up, I hadn't had any sleep for three nights, but that wasn't the reason. I was normal then, just another communications man, intent on radio and this new equipment and without any of the crazy impractical notions that had lost me my job later. They called it overwork, but I knew they thought the explosion had disturbed my brain. I didn't blame them. I would have liked to think so. It started one day in the lab with a shadow on the sun and an elusive short circuit that gave me shock after shock until I was jittery. By the time I had it fixed, the oscillator had gone out of control. I got a series of low-frequency waves that were like nothing I'd ever seen before. Then there was something like a voice speaking out of a very old, jerry-built amateur radio set. Except that there wasn't a receiver in the lab, and no one else had heard it. I wasn't sure myself because right then every instrument in the place went haywire, and five minutes later part of the ceiling hit the floor and the floor went up through the roof. They found me, they say, lying half-crushed under a beam, and I woke up eighteen hours later in a hospital with four cracked ribs, and a feeling as if I'd had a lot of voltage poured into me. It went in the report that I'd been struck by lightning. It took me a long time to get well. The ribs healed fast faster than the doctor liked. I didn't mind the hospital part, except that I couldn't walk without shaking, or light a cigarette without burning myself for months. The thing I minded was what I remember before I woke up. Delirium, that was what they told me, but the kind and type of scars on my body didn't ring true. Electricity, even freak lightning, doesn't make that kind of burns and my corner of the world doesn't make a habit of branding people. Not before I could show the scars to anybody outside the hospital, they were gone. Not healed, just gone. I remembered the look on the medic's face when I showed him the place where the scars had been. He didn't think I was crazy, he thought he was. I knew the lab hadn't been struck by lightning. The Major knew it, too. I found that out the day I reported back to work. All the time we talked, his big pen moved in stubby circles across the page of his logbook, and he talked without raising his head to look at me. I know all that, Ken Scott. No electrical storms reported in the vicinity. No radio disturbance within a thousand miles. But 
His jaw grew stubborn. The lab was wrecked and you were hurt. We've got to have something for the record." I could understand all that. What I resented was the way they treated me after I went back to work. They transferred me to another division and another line of work. They turned down my request to follow up those non-typical waves. My private notes were ripped out of my notebook while I was at lunch and I never saw them again. And as soon as they could, they shipped me to Fairbanks, Alaska, and that was the end of that. The Major told me all I needed to know, the day before I took the plane to Alaska. His scowl said more than his words, and they said plenty. I'd let it alone, Kent Scott. No sense stirring up more trouble. We can't bother with side alleys, anyhow. Next time you monkey with it, you might get your head blown off, not just a dose of stray voltage out of the blue. We've done everything but stand on our heads trying to find out where that spare energy came from and where it went. But we've marked that whole line of research closed, Kent Scott. If I were you, I'd keep my mouth shut about it." It wasn't a message from Mars, I suggested unsmiling, and he didn't think that was funny either. But there was relief on his face as I left the office and went to clean out my drawer. I got along all right in Alaska, for a while, but I wasn't the same. The armistice had hardly been signed when they sent me back to the States with a recommendation of overwork. I tried to explain it to Andy. They said I needed a rest. Maybe so. The shock did something funny to me. Tore me open. Like the electric shock treatment they give catatonic patients. I know a lot of things I never learned. Ordinary radio work doesn't mean anything to me anymore. It doesn't make sense. When people out west were talking about flying saucers or whatever they were, and when they talked about weather disturbances after the atomic tests, things did make sense for a while. And when we came down here... I paused, trying to fit confused impressions together. He wasn't going to believe me anyhow, but I wanted him to. A tree slapped against the cabin window. I jumped. It started up again the day we came up in the mountains energy out of nowhere, following me around. It can't knock me out. Have you noticed I let you turn the lights on and off? The day we came up, I shorted my electric razor and blew out five fuses trying to change one. Yeah, I remember. You had to drive me to town for them. My brother's eyes watched me uneasy. Mike, you're kidding. I wish I were, I said. That energy just drains into me and nothing happens. I'm immune." I shrugged, rose and walked across to the radio I'd put in here, so carefully before the war. I picked up the disconnected plug, thrust it into the socket. I snapped the dial on. "'I'll show you,' I told him. The panel flashed and darkened. Confused static came cracking from the speaker, erratic. I took my hand away. "'Turn it up,' Andy said uneasily. My hand twiddled the dial. It's already up. Try another station, the kid insisted stubbornly. I pushed all the buttons in succession. The static crackled and buzzed, the panel light flickered on and off in little cryptic flashes. I sighed. And reception was perfect at noon, I told him. You were listening to the news. I took my hand away again. I don't want to blow the thing up. Andy came over and switched the button back on. The little panel light glowed steadily, and the mellow voice of Milton Cross filled the room. Now conduct the Boston Philharmonic Orchestra in the Fifth or Fate Symphony of Ludwig von Beethoven. The noise of mixed applause, and then the majestic chords of the symphony, thundering through the rooms of the cabin. Ta-da-da-dum! Ta-da-da-dum! My brother stared at me as racing woodwinds caught up with the brasses. There was nothing wrong with the radio. Mike, what did you do to it? I wish I knew, I told him. Reaching, I touched the volume button again. Beethoven died in a muttering static like a thousand drums. I swore, and Andy sucked in his breath between his teeth, edging warily backward. He touched the dials again. Once more the smoothness of the fate symphony rolled out and swallowed us. I shivered. 
You'd better let it alone," Andy said shakily. The kid turned in early, but I stayed in the main room, smoking restlessly and wishing I could get a drink without driving eighty miles over bad mountain roads. Neither of us had thought to turn off the radio. It was moaning out some interminable throbbing jazz. I turned over my notes, restlessly, not really seeing them. Once Andy's voice came sleepily from the alcove. "'Going to read all night, Mike?' "'If I feel like it,' I said tersely, and began walking up and down again. "'Michael, for the love of God, stop it and let me get some sleep!' Andy exploded, and I sank down in the chair again. "'Sorry, Andy.' Where had the intangible part of me been, those eighteen hours when I first lay crushed under a fallen beam, then under morphine in the hospital? Where had those scars come from? More important, what had made a radio lab blow up in the first place? Electricity sets fires. It shocks men into insensibility or death. It doesn't explode. Radio waves are in themselves harmless. Most important of all, what maniac freak of lightning was I carrying in my body that made me immune to electrical current? I hadn't told Andy about the time I'd deliberately grounded the electric dynamo in the cellar and taken the whole voltage in my body. I was still alive. It would have been a hell of a way to commit suicide, but I hadn't. I swore, slamming down the window. I was going to bed. Andy was right. Either I was crazy, or there was something wrong. In any case, sitting here wouldn't help. If it didn't let up, I'd take the first train home and see a good electrician, or a psychiatrist. But right now, I was going to hit the sack. My hand went out automatically and switched the light off. Damn, I thought incredulously. I'd shorted the dynamo again. The radio stopped as if the whole orchestra had dropped dead. Every light in the cabin winked softly out but my hand on the switch crackled with a phosphorescent glow as the entire house current poured into my body. I tingled with a weird shock. I heard my own teeth chattering. And something snapped wide open in my brain. I heard, suddenly, an excited voice shouting, "'Reese! Reese! That is the man!' End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of Falcons of Narabedla by Marion Zimmer Bradley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《Chapter Two, Rainbow City. You are mad," said the man with the tired voice. I was drifting. I was swaying, bodiless, over a huge abyss of caverned space, chasmed, immense, limitless. Vaguely, through a sleeping distance, I heard two voices. This one was old and very tired. "'You are mad. They will know. Narayan will know.' "'Narayan is a fool,' said the second voice. "'Narayan is the dreamer,' the tired voice said. "'He is the dreamer, and where the dreamer walks he will know. But have it your way.' I am very old, and it does not matter. I give you this power freely, to spare you. But Gamin, Gamin, the second voice stopped. After a long time, You are old and a fool, Reese, it said. What is Gamin to me? Bodiless, blind, I drifted and swayed and swung in the sound of the voices. The humming, like a million high-tension wires, sang around me and I felt myself cradled in the pull of a great magnet that held me suspended surely on nothingness and drew me down into the field of some force beneath. Far below me the voices faded. I swung free, fell, plunged downward in sickening motion, head over heels, into the abyss. My feet struck hard flooring. I wrenched back to consciousness with a jolt. Winds blew coldly in my face. The cabin walls had been flung back to the high-lying stars. I was standing at a barred window at the very pinnacle of a tall tower, in the lap of a weird blueness that arched flickeringly in the night. I caught a glimpse of a startled face, 
a lean, tired old face beneath a peaked hood, in the moment before my knees gave way and I fell, striking my head against the bars of the window. I was lying on a narrow, high bed in a room filled with doors and bars. I could see the edge of a carved mirror set in a frame, and the top of a chest of some kind. On a bench at the edge of my field of vision there were two figures sitting. One was the old grey man, hunched wearily beneath his robe, wearing robes like a Tibetan lama's, somber black and a peaked hood of grey. The other was a slimmer, younger figure, swathed in silken, silver veiling, with a thin opacity where the face should have been, and a sort of opalescent shine of flesh through silvery sapphire silks. The figure was that of a boy or slim, immature girl. It sat erect, motionless, and for a long time I studied it, curious, between half-open lids. But when I blinked it rose and passed through one of the multitudinous doors. At once a soft sibilance of draperies announced return. I sat up, getting my feet to the floor, or almost there. The bed was higher than a hospital bed. The blue robe held a handled mug, like a baby's drinking cup at me. I took it in my hand, hesitated. "'Neither drug nor poison,' said the blue robe mockingly, and the voice was as noncommittal as the veiled body. A sexless voice, soft alto, a woman's or a boy's. "'Drink, and be glad it is none of Karami's brewing.' I tasted the liquid in the mug. It had an indeterminate greenish look and a faint pungent taste I could not identify, although it reminded me variously of anise and garlic. It seemed to remove the last traces of shock. I handed the cup back empty and looked sharply at the old man in the llama costume. "'You're Reese, I said. "'Where in hell have I gotten to?' At least that's what I meant to say. Imagine my surprise when I found myself asking, in a language I'd never heard but understood perfectly, to which of the domains of Zandru have I been consigned now? At the same moment I became conscious of what I was wearing. It seemed to be an old-fashioned nightshirt, chopped off at the loins, deep crimson in color. Red flannels yet, I thought, with a gulp of dismay. I checked my impulse to get out of bed. Who could act sane in a red nightshirt? "'You might have the decency to explain where I am,' I said, "'if you know.' The tiredness seemed part of Reese's voice. Adric, he said wearily, "'try to remember.' He shrugged his lean shoulders. "'You are in your own tower, and you have been under restraint again. I am sorry.' His voice sounded futile. I felt prickling shivers run down my backbone. In spite of the weird surroundings, the phrase under restraint had struck home. I was a lunatic in an asylum. The blue-robed one cut in in that smooth, sexless, faint, sarcastic voice. While Karami holds the amnesia ray, Reese, you will be explaining it to him a dozen times a cycle. He will never be of use to us again. This time Karami won. Edric, try to remember. You were at home in Narabedla. I shook my head. Nightshirt or no nightshirt, I'd face this on my feet. I walked to Reese, put my clenched hands on his shoulders. Explain this. Who am I supposed to be? You called me Edric. I'm no more Edric than you are. Edric, you are not amusing. The blue robe's voice was edged with anger. Use what intelligence you have left. You have had enough Sherrig antidote to cure a Tharl. Now, who are you? The words were meaningless. I stared, trapped. I clung to hold on to identity. Adric, I said, bewildered. That was my name. Was it? Wasn't it? No. I was Mike Kenscott. Hang on to that. Two and two are four. The circumference equals the radius squared times pi. Four rolls is the chemming of a twilp. Stop that. Mike Kenscott. Summer, 1954. 
Army Serial Number 13-48746. Karami. I cradled my bursting head in my hands. I'm crazy. Or you are. Or we're both sane, and this monkey business is all real. It is real, said Rhys, compassion in his tired face. He has been very far on the time ellipse, Gamine. Adric, try to understand. This was Karami's work. She sent you out on a timeline, far, very far into the past. Into a time when the earth was different. She hoped you would come back changed, or mad. His eyes brooded. I think she succeeded. Gamine, I have long outstayed my leave. I must return to my own tower, or die. Will you explain? I will. A hint of emotion flickered in the voice of Gamine. Go, master. Rhys left the room, through one of the doors. Gamine turned impatiently to me again. We waste time this way. Fool, look at yourself. I strode to a mirror that lined one of the doors. Above the crimson nightshirt I saw a face. Not my own. The sight rocked my mind. Out of the mirror a man's face looked anxiously. A face eagle-thin, darkly mustached, with sharp green eyes. The body belonging to the face that was not mine was lean and long and strongly muscled, and not quite human. I squeezed my eyes shut. This couldn't be. I opened my eyes. The man in the red nightshirt I was wearing was still reflected there. I turned my back on the mirror, walking to one of the barred windows to look down on the familiar outline of the Sierra Madre, about a hundred miles away. I couldn't have been mistaken. I knew that ridge of mountains. But between me and the mountains lay a thickly forested expanse of land which looked like no scenery I had ever seen in my life. I was standing near the pinnacle of a high tower. I dimly saw the curve of another, just out of my line of vision. The whole landscape was bathed in a curiously pinkish light. Through an overcast sky I could just make out, dimly, the shadowy disk of a watery red sun. Then. No, I wasn't dreaming, I really did see it. Beyond it, a second sun. Blue-white, shining brilliantly, pallid through the clouds, but brighter than any sunlight I had ever seen. It was proof enough for me. I turned desperately to Gamine behind me. Where have I gotten to? Where... when am I? Two suns? Those mountains? The change in Gamine's voice was swift. The veiled face lifted questioningly to mine. What I had thought a veil was not that. It seemed to be more like a shimmering screen wrapped around the features so that Gammy was faceless, an invisible person with substance but no apprehensible characteristics. Yes, it was like that, as if there was an invisible person wearing the curious silken draperies. But the invisible flesh was solid enough. Hands like cold steel gripped my shoulders. You have been back? Back to the days before the second sun? Adric, tell me, did Earth truly have but one sun?" Wait, I begged. You mean I've traveled in time? The exultation faded from Gamine's voice imperceptibly. Never mind, it is improbable in any case. No, Adric, not really traveling. You were only sent out on the time ellipse till you contacted someone in that other time. Perhaps you stayed in contact with his mind so long that you think you are he." "'I'm not Adric,' I raged. "'Adric sent me here!' I saw the blurring around Gamine's invisible features twitch in a headshake. "'It's never been proven that two minds can be interchanged like that. Adric's body, Adric's brain. The brain convolutions, the memory centers, the habit patterns, you'd still be Adric. The idea that you are someone else is only an illusion of your conscious mind. It will wear off." I shook my head, puzzled. I still don't believe it. Where am I? Gammy moved impatiently. Oh, very well. You are Adric of Narabedla. 
and if you are sane again, Lord of the Crimson Tower. I am Gamine." The swathed shoulders moved a little. "'You don't remember. I am a spell-singer. I jerked my elbow toward the window. "'Those are my own mountains out there,' I said roughly. "'I'm not Adric, whoever he is. My name's Mike Kenscott, and your hanky-panky doesn't impress me. Take off that veil and let me see your face.' "'I wish you meant that,' a mournfulness breathed in the soft contralto. A sudden fury blazed up in me from nowhere. "'And what right have you to pry for that old fool Reese? Get back to your own place, then, spell-singer!' I broke off, appalled. What was I saying? Worse, what did I mean by it? Gamine turned. The sexless voice was coldly amused. Adric spoke, then. Whoever sits in the seat of your soul, you are the same, and past redemption." The robes whispered sibilantly on the floor as Gamine moved to the door. Karami is welcome to her slave. The door slammed. Left alone, I flung myself down on the high bed, stubbornly concentrating on Mike Kenscott, shutting out the vague, blurred mystery in my mind that was Adric impinging on my consciousness. I was not Adric. I would not be. I dared not go to the window and look out at the terrifying two suns, even to see the reassurance of the familiar Sierra Madre skyline. A homesick terror was hurting in me. But persistently the Adric memories came, a guilty feeling of a shirked duty, and a frightened face, a real face, not a blurred nothingness, beneath Gamine's blue veils memories of strange hunts and a big bird on the pommel of a high saddle, a bird hooded like a falcon, in crimson. Consciousness of dress made me remember the nightshirt I still wore. Moving swiftly, without conscious thought, I went to a door and slid it open, pulled out some garments and dressed in them. Every garment in the closet was the same color, deep-hued crimson. I glanced in the mirror, and a phrase Gaming had used broke the surface of my mind like a leaping fish. Lord of the Crimson Tower! Well, I looked it. There had been knives and swords in the closet. I took out one to look at it, and before I realized what I was doing I had belted it across my hip. I stared, decided to let it remain. It looked all right with the rest of the costume. It felt right, too. Another door folded back noiselessly, and a man stood looking at me. He was young, and would have been handsome in an effeminate way if his face had not been so arrogant. Lean, somehow cat-like, it was easy to determine that he was akin to Adric, or me, even before the automatic habit of memory fitted name and identity to him. Everin, I said warily. He came forward moving so softly that for an uneasy moment I wondered if he had pads like a cat's on his feet. He wore deep green from head to foot, similar to the crimson garments that clothed me. His face had a flickering, as if he could at a moment's notice raise a barrier of invisibility like Gamine's about himself. He didn't look as human as I. "'I have seen Gamine,' he said. "'She says you are awake, and as sane as you ever were.' We of Narabedla are not so strong that we can afford to waste even a broken tool like you." Wrath, Adric's wrath, boiled up in me. But Everin moved lifely backward. "'I am not Gamine,' he warned, "'and I will not be served like Gamine has been served. Take care.' "'Take care yourself,' I muttered, knowing little else I could have said. Everin drew back thin lips. Why? You have been set out on the time ellipse till you are only a shadow of yourself. But all this is beside the point. Karami says you are to be freed, so the seals are off all the doors, and the Crimson Tower is no longer a prison to you. Come and go as you please. Karami, his lips formed a sneer, if you call that freedom. I said slowly, You think I'm not crazy? Everin snorted. Except, where Karami is concerned, you never were. What is that to me? I have everything I need. 
the dreamer gives me good hunting and slaves enough to do my bidding. For the rest, I am the toy-maker. I need little. But you—" His voice leaped with contempt. You ride time at Karami's bidding, and your dreamer walks, waiting the coming of his power that he may destroy us all one day. I stared somberly at Everin, standing still near the door. The words seemed to wake an almost personal shame in me. The boy watched, and his face lost some of his bitterness. He said more quietly, The falcon flown cannot be recalled. I came only to tell you that you are free." He turned, shrugging his thin shoulders, and walked to the window. As I say, if you call that freedom. I followed him to the window. The clouds were clearing. The two suns shone with a blinding brilliance. By looking far to the left, I could see a line of rainbow-tinted towers that rose into the sky, tall and capped with slender spires. I could distinguish five clearly. One, the nearest, seemed made of a jeweled blue. One, clear emerald green. Golden, flame-colored violet. There were more beyond, but the colors were blurred and dim. They made a semicircle about a wooded park. Beyond them, the familiar skyline of the mountain tugged old memories in my brain. The sun swung high in a sky that held no tint of blue, that was as clear and colorless as ice. Abruptly I turned my back on it all. Everin murmured, Narabedla, last of the rainbow cities. Adric, how long now? I did not answer. Karami wants me? Everin's laugh was only a soundless shaking of his thin shoulders. Karami can wait. Better for you if she waited forever. Come along with me, or Gammon will be back. You don't want to see Gammon, do you?" He sounded anxious. I shook my head. Emphatically, I did not want to see that insidious spook again. No. Why, should I? Everin looked relieved. Come along, then. If I know Gamine, you're pretty well muddled. Amnesiac. I'll explain. After all, his voice mocked, you are my brother. He thrust open the door and motioned me through. Instinctively I drew back, gesturing him to lead the way. He laughed soundlessly and went, and I followed, letting it slide shut behind me. We went downstairs and more stairs. I walked it ever inside, one part of me wondering why I was not more panicky. I was a stranger in a world gone insane. Yet I had that outrageous calmness with which men do fantastic things in a dream. I was simply taking one step after another, knowing what to do with that part of me that was Adric. Gamine had spoken of habit patterns, the convolutions of the brain. I had Adric's body. Only a superficial me, an outer ego, was still a strange, muddled Mike Kenscott. The subconscious Adric was guiding me. I let him ride. I felt it would be wise to be very much Adric around Everin. We stepped into an elevator shaft which went down, curved around corners with a speed that threw me against the wall, then began slowly to rise. I had long since lost all sense of direction. Abruptly the door of the shaft opened and we began to walk along a long, brilliantly illuminated passage. From somewhere we heard singing a voice somewhere in the range of a trained boy's voice or a woman's mature contralto. Gamine's voice. I could make no sense of the words, but Everin halted to listen, swearing in a whisper. I thought the faraway voice sang my name and Everin's, but I could not tell. What is it, Everin? He gave a short exclamation, the sense of which was lost on me. Come along, he said irritably. It is only the spell-singer, singing old Reese back to sleep. You waked him this time, did you not? I wonder Gamine permitted it. He is very near his last sleep, old Reese. I think you will send him there soon." Without giving me a chance to answer, and for that matter I had no answer ready, he pulled me aside between recessed walls and again the shaft in which we stood began to ride. Eventually we stepped into a room at the top of another tower, 
a room lavishly, even garishly furnished. Everin flung himself carelessly on a divan embroidered in silk and purple, and gestured me to follow his example. "'Well, now tell me, where in time has Karami sent you now?' "'Karami?' I asked tentatively. Everin's raucous laugh rang out again. He said with seeming irrelevance, but with an odd air of confiding, "'My one demand of the dreamer is freedom from that witch's spells. Some day I shall fashion a toy for her. I am not the toy-maker of Nerabedla for nothing. I demand little enough of the dreamers, Zandru knows. I do not like to pay their price, but Karami does not care what she pays. So he made a spreading movement of his hands. She has power over everyone, except me. Yes, assuredly, I must make her a toy. She sent you out on the time ellipse. I wonder who brought you back." I shook my head. I've been out of my body too long. I can't remember much. You remember me, Everin said. I wonder why she left you that. Karimi's amnesia rays took the rest of your memory. She never trusted me that far before. But I caught the crafty look in his face. I knew only this about Everin. Karimi was right not to trust him. I said, I only remember your name, nothing more. Because Everin, I knew, was never ten minutes the same. He would profess friendship and mean friendship. Ten minutes later, still in friendship, he would flay the skin from my body and count it only an exquisite joke. I did not like those perverted and subtle eyes. He seemed to read my thought. Good, we will be strangers. Brothers are too... He let the word trail off, unfinished. What have you forgotten? Could I trust him with my terrible puzzlement? How much could I, as Adric, and I must be Adric to him, get along without knowing? What was even more to the point, how many questions could I dare ask without betraying my own helplessness? I compromised. What are the dreamers? That had been the wrong question. Zandru, Adric, you have been far indeed. You must have been back before the cataclysm. Well, our forefathers, after the cataclysm, ruled this planet and built the Rainbow Cities. That was before the compact that killed machines. Some people say the dreamers were born from the dead machines. He began to pace the floor restlessly. They were men, once, he said. They are born from men and women. Mendel knows what caused them. But one in every ten million men is such a freak, a dreamer. Some say they came out of the cataclysm. Some say they are the souls of the dead machines. They are human and not human. They were telepaths. They could control everything, things, minds, people. They could throw illusions around things and men. They contested our rules." He sat down. His voice became brooding, quiet. One of us, here in Rainbow City, a dozen generations ago, found a way to bind the dreamers, he said. We could not kill them. They were deathless, normally. But we could bind them in sleep. As they slept, under a forced stasis, we could make them give up their powers to us, so that we controlled the things they controlled, for a price." There was a glimpse of horror behind his eyes. "'You know the price. It is high.' I kept silent. I wanted Everin to go on. He shivered a little, shook his head, and the horror vanished. So each of us has a dreamer of his own who can grant him power to do as he wills. And after years and years, as the dreamers grow old, they grow mortal. They can be killed. And fewer are born now, fewer to each generation. As they grow older and weaker, it is safe to let them wake, but never too strongly or too long." He laughed bitterly. A fury came from nowhere into his face. "'And you loosed a dreamer!' he cried. A dreamer with all his power hardly come upon him. He is harmless as yet, 
but he wakes and he walks, and one day the power will come upon him, and he will destroy us all." Everin's thin features were drawn with despair, not arrogant now, but full of suffering. "'A dreamer,' he sighed, "'a dreamer, and you have been made one with him already. Can you see now why we do not trust you, brother?' Without answering, I rose and went to the window. This window did not look on the neat little park, but on a vast tract of wild country. Far away, curious trails of smoke spiraled up into the sunlight, and a wispy fog lay in the bottomlands. "'Down there,' said Everin in a low voice, "'down there the dreamer walks and waits. Down there!' But I did not hear the rest for my mind completed it. Down there, down there is my lost memory. Down there was my life. Somewhere down there I had left my soul. End of chapter 2this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 Flowers of Danger I turn my back on the window. Rhys is a dreamer, I said with slow certainty. What is Gamine? Everin nodded slowly, ignoring the question. Rhys is a dreamer, yes. He is old, so old, he is almost mortal now. So he wakes, and he too walks. But he was one of us once, the only dreamer ever born within the Rainbow City. His loyalty is double, but he will never harm Nerabedla, because he is of our blood." Everin cleared his throat. So Gamine takes what knowledge can be had from his old, old mind, and does not pay. "'Who is Gamine?' I asked again. Everin still hesitated. Karami hates Gamine, he said after minutes. So no man sees Gamine's face. I would not ask too many questions, unless you ask them of Karami. A smile flickered on the mobile features. Ask Karami, he said gleefully. She will tell. She will? I said stupidly, because I could think of nothing else to say. Everin's grin was delicately malicious. Oh, I am sure of that. Karami is quick to strike. Gamine and I have little love lost, but we agree on one thing, that Karami's procession of slaves is monstrous, and that you are a fool to help Karami pay for her desires. Karami is far too fond of power in her own hands to pay to put it into yours. Karami. Karami, who took my memory. She did, Everin murmured, and I realized I had spoken aloud. The room seemed full of a weighty silence. Everin's prowling footsteps made no noise as he came to my side. I can give it back to you, though. I have made you a toy. His effete voice rather disgusted me, and I moved away, but he followed. Look here and find your memory and he put something small and hard into my hand, something wrapped in silvery silks. I raised my hand curiously, untwisting the wrappings. They were smooth and shining and colorless, with a bluish cast, like Gamine's veils, no fabric I had ever seen. Everin backed slowly away from me. For an instant all I could see was a blurred invisibility, like Gamine's face behind the veils, then a sort of mirror became slowly visible. It did not seem to reflect anything, rather it was a coldly shining surface, cloudy, glittering from within. I bent to examine the pattern of the shadows that moved on the surface. There was a curious pull from the mirror, a cold that crept sluggishly from my hand, a familiar, soothing cold. As if drawn by a magnet, my eyes bent closer recognition crashed in my mind. Everin and his guilt-deadly toys. I dashed the colorless thing to the floor, giving it a savage kick. The blurred invisibility wavered. 
I caught a glimpse of a tiny jeweled mechanism before it sprang back to gray ice again. Everin had backed halfway across the room. I leaped at him, collaring the dandy and wrenching him close. "'I've got a good mind to tie the thing across your throat,' I grated. Everin's lip twisted up. Suddenly his whole face melted in a blurry invisibility, and I felt his whole substance evaporate from between my hands. He writhed like smoke, and I leaped backward just as he materialized, whole and deadly, too close. "'I am always guarded,' he jerked out at me. "'I might have known.' He stooped, reaching for the fallen toy. I kicked the little mirror out of his reach, bent to retrieve it. "'I'll keep this,' I said, and wadding the insulated silk around it, I thrust it into a pocket. Everin's eyes glared at me helplessly. "'You'll stay solid for a while now,' I jeered. "'Toymaker! Damned freak!' I stormed out of the room, leaving him rubbing his bruised shoulder. Now that Adric was back in control, I had no trouble discovering where I wanted to go. Some blind instinct led me through the maze of elevators and staircases. I stepped into servants' quarters, kitchens, a room full of buzzing machinery I dismissed with a glance of familiarity and finally found myself in the open, the semicircle of rainbow towers around me. Overhead the suns, red and white, sent a curious, double-shadowed light downward through the neatly trimmed trees. A little day moon, smaller than any moon I had known, peeped, a curious crescent, over the edge of a mountain. The grass under my feet was just grass, but the brightly tinted flowers and mathematically regular beds were strange to me. Paths, bordered by narrow ditches to keep the pedestrian off the flowers, wandered in and out of this strange pleasance. I accepted all this without conscious thought, but some unconscious scrap of memory gave me a vague practical reason for the ditches. I carefully avoided them. Faint shrill music tugged siren-like at my ears, wordless like Gamine's crooning. Staring, I realized that the flowers themselves sang the singing flowers of Karamy's garden, I remembered their lotus song. A song of welcome, or of danger. I was not alone in the garden. Men, kilted and belted in the same gaudy red and gold as the flowers, passed and repassed restlessly, unquiet as chained flames. For a moment the old vanity turned uppermost in my mind. For all her slaves, all her lovers, Karamy paid tribute to the lord of the Crimson Tower. Paid, would continue to pay. The men passed me, silent. They were sordid, but their swords were blunt, like children's toys. They were a regiment of corpses, of zombies. Their salutes as I passed were jerky, mechanical. A high note sang suddenly in the flowers. I felt, not heard, their empty parading cease. In a weird ballet they ranged themselves into blind lines that filed away nowhere, toy soldiers, all alike. And between the backs of the toy soldiers and the patterned, painted flowers I saw a man running. Another me, from another world, thought briefly of the card soldiers, flat on their faces in the Red Queen's garden. Wonderland! I heard myself say, with half-conscious amusement, they all look so alike until you turn them over." The man running between the ditched flower-beds was no dummy from a pack of cards. I saw him beckon, still running. He called to me, to Adric. "'Adric, Karamy walks here. Just listen to the flowers. I was afraid I'd have to get all the way into the tower to find you.' His voice was urgent, breathless. He slid to a stop not three feet from me. "'Narayan knew they'd freed you. He's outside the gates. He sent me to help. Come on!" The sight of the man touched another of those live-wires in my brain, the name of Narayan another still. "'Narayan,' I said in dull recognition. The word on my lips hit a chord of fear, of dread and danger. But I had come straight from Everin. I knew the man. I knew the response he expected but the brief glimpse into Everin's mirror had set up a chain of actions I could not control. I tried to put out my hand in friendly greeting. Instead I felt, with horror, my fingers at my belt and tried, without success, 
to halt the sword that flew without volition from its sheath. The man backed away, his eyes full of terror. Adric, no! The sign! He held up one arm, deprecatingly, then howled with agony, clutching the severed fingers. I heard my own voice, savage, inhuman, the thin laughter of Everin snarling through it. Sign? There's a sign for you! The man threw himself out of range, but his face, convulsed with pain, held a stunned bewilderment. Adric, Narayan promised you were sane, he breathed. I forced my sword back into the scabbard, staring without comprehension at the blood from the wound I had inflicted, and at the darting heads of the flowers. I could not kill this man who carried the name of Narayan on his tongue. The flowers twitched, stirred, threw tendrils at the man's bleeding hand. A quick nausea tightened my throat. I motioned urgently to him. Run! I begged. Quick, or I can't. The flowers shrilled. The man threw back his head, his eyes wide with panic, and screamed. Carry me! I. He staggered back wildly, teetering on the edge of the ditch. I cried another warning, incoherent but too late. He trod on the flowers, stumbled across the little ditch. The writhing flower heads shot up shoulder high. They screamed a wild paean of flower music and he fell among them, sprawling, floundering helplessly. I heard him scream, hoarsely, horribly. I turned my eyes away. There was a wild thrashing, a flailing, a yell that died and echoed among the brilliant towers. There was a sort of purring murmur from the blossoms. Then the flowers stilled and were quiet, waving innocently behind their ditches. Carami, gold and fire, walked along the winding path through the trees and in the space of a second I forgot the man who lay lifeless in the bed of the terrible flowers. Carami was all gold. From her glowing crown of hair to the tips of her little slippers she was one sunny shimmer. There was amber on her brows and at her throat, and an amber rod twisted lightly between her fingers, its delicate movement outlining my face. Carami's smile of welcome was a dream which made me know I could be well content if this were my world. But old habit made me turn my face away. Her eyes, cat eyes of wide yellow, watched me slyly, but her face was turned to the sprawled man in the flowers. So I thought I heard something. Without taking her eyes from my face, she spun the lucent rod. The flower song rose again, a soft, keening wail. Two of the silent guards moved noiselessly through the garden, and, at an expressive movement of the rod, they lifted the corpse and bore it away. The music died. The woman's hands went out to pull me close. Adric, Adric, as soon as you are free, they pursue you. That is not what you want, is it? Isn't it? I asked shortly. I still could not look full at the cat-eyes, the caressing face. A memory scuttled, rabbit-fashion, across my mind, giving name and identity to the man I had betrayed to the flowers. Carmi slid in front of me so I had to look at her, and the lovely lazy voice murmured the name I was beginning to know. "'You are angry,' the soft voice caressed me. "'I knew it was not right to let Everin near you. Adric, we need you. Nerabedla needs you. We felt betrayed when you left us, when you shut yourself up alone with your stars. Have you forgotten, or are you still my lover?" It rang phony. Phony was the way I put it to myself. Part of me felt like calling her a lying she-devil and having that much at least on record. But I was fast acquiring a double cunning. The animal cunning of Adric's old habit, and a desperate, trapped cunning of my own born of a desperate fear of this unfamiliar world. There was nothing I could do except ride on the surface and let my hunches take me where they would. Carami was very soft and sweet and something more than lovely in my arms, and I held her crushingly close while I struggled with a memory. Who was Carami? Who and what was I? Carami dropped her arms. The mantle of lazy seductiveness dropped with them. She spoke with eager annoyance. "'You are still angry because I sent you on the time ellipse. You do not know it was for your own good. 
You haven't learned your lesson yet." That talk meant danger for me. I could think of only one way to silence it. She seemed to like it, but even with her lips acquiescent under mine, I was wary. Was I fooling her, or was she only playing my own game, and playing it a little better? Now we can make plans, she said a little later. First, Gamine. She looked sharply at me, but I kept my face expressionless. Gamine is always with the old dreamer. She lets him wake. He will grow too strong. We must send Rhys away from Nerabedla. Gamine may stay or follow him to exile, but Rhys must go. Rhys must go, I conceded. He should be slain, but Gamine will never do it, said Kermi with a shrug that disposed of Rhys. Everin, she snapped her jeweled fingers. His dreamer sleeps sound. Everin fears even his own power. My dreamer grows strong, but he serves me. The beautiful face looked ruthless and savage. Your dreamer walks, free in the forest. Only you can rebind him. You, with my help, Adric of the Crimson Tower. Her eyes smoldered. Yes and my dreamer shall serve you as well till then," she breathed. I will pay to put power in your hands. The very phrase Everin had used, a shudder stung me briefly. Her glowing face burned through my sting of fear. I go to the dreamer this night, Adric. Ride with me, and he shall lead you where the dreamer walks, and lead you back to power. I have said enough. The lambent eyes tilted at me. Have I not? She had, and too much. For I knew now how the dreamer must be paid, and the small part of me that was still my Kenscott cowered, the rest of me accepted the memory with a shrug. It was this Adric part that spoke. I'll go, and afterward I'll go into the forest where the dreamer walks and bring him back to you. But even as I swept Karami into my arms and bent her head back roughly under my mouth, a warning prickle iced my spine. I said, insinuatingly, And then, Karami. But my eyes narrowed over her golden head. Karami had tricked me before this. End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of Falcons of Narabedla by Marion Zimmer Bradley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 Trapped Afterward, when I had found my way back to the Crimson Tower, I searched for hours for something that might give a clue to Adric's mystifying past. I was puzzled about this Adric who came and went as he pleased in the chambers of my memory. But I found nothing. Whoever had stolen Adric's memory, had made sure that nothing in his surroundings should clear up the puzzle in his mind. I knew only one thing. Adric was feared, disliked, distrusted by all the Narabedlans, and all except Gamine had something to gain by feigning friendship. I could not decide whether Karami's attitude was love that pretended contempt to mold Adric or me to her will, or contempt that pretended love for the same reason. And although habit found affection for Everin, I could not trust him long. Trust a cyclone sooner than that half-mad effeminate. The name, Narayan, stuck burr-like in my mind. Friend or enemy? I sat at the barred window of Adric's high room, trying to force memory from the alien mind in which I was prisoner. And whether it was sheer effort of will, or the result of the fragmentary look in Everin's mirror, or whether, as Gamine insisted, I was really Adric, and Mike Kenscott was a mere superficial illusion of my conscious mind, memory did begin to pulse back. In the early days. In the early days, before the vagueness came on my mind, I, Adric of the Crimson Tower, had been a power in the Rainbow City. The memories of that time were not the kind Mike Kenscott would have cared to own, but I, as Adric, found them vastly pleasing. Unlike Gamine, who loved only knowledge, or Everin, who toyed with pleasure and trickery, I had wanted power. I had it, unlimited, from a dreamer who stirred only vaguely in sleep. 
half the known portions of this world had known the Crimson Tower as Lord. And Karami. Some memories were triumphant, some were humorous in Adric's cynical mind, some were terrible beyond guessing, for Adric had not counted cost, and even he shuddered from the price the dreamer had exacted. Then to this willful and wild man something had happened. I had no idea what. Karami had reached that far back and blurred, though not entirely erased, my memory. It had something to do with a blond boy's face, lifted in credulous terror, or joy. And a fleeing form, veiled, that retreated down the long corridor of my mind, averting its face as I followed. Whatever had happened, it had come when Adric was sick with blood and horror, when he was surfeited, even if momentarily, with conquest and sickened at the price the dreamer extorted. The power, forced through the mind of the dreamer, called for energy, kinetic energy, available from one source and one only. Adric had fed the dreamer with that power, for a while. One day, as a whim, I had redeemed a young woman slave, then the vagueness came and choked me. I might think, I might burst my brain, but so far and no farther my memories would carry me. I could not force memory of that chain of events. But after that, Adric's reign had collapsed like the unstable arch it had been, his army scattered, and he had shut himself up or been imprisoned in his tower. His memories had been stolen, and he had gone, or been sent, spinning along a timeline forward, or perhaps back, until somewhere in the abyss of time he touched Mike Kenscott. It had been then, perhaps, that Adric had escaped. He had reached, drawn Mike Kenscott back, and switched the two. It was a perfect escape from a life Adric had come to hate. But I was Adric. There was an explanation for that, too. The physical body could not make the transit in time. I had Adric's body, the convolutions of his brain, the synaptic links of habit, his memory banks. Only the ego, the superimposed pattern of the conscious identity, insisted I was Mike Kenscott. In Adric's body the old patterns ruled, and to all intents and purposes I was Adric. And back in my own time I thought Adric was living in my body, living Mike Kenscott's life, going through the motions with only the same queer lapses I was making here. And after a while even these would stop. I was wholly trapped. Here, living Adric's life, the part of me that was Adric would grow stronger and stronger, till he unseated the other identity wholly. And he in my body? Andy, I thought with a wild swift fear, what will he do to Andy? Nothing. He could not hurt Andy, not in my pattern, any more than I could hate Everin. Or could he? I had to get back. God, I had to get back. When the white sun had set and the red sun glowed a darkening ember across the Sierra, a summons came, brought by one of Karami's toy soldier cohorts. I dressed, in crimson again, for there was no other clothing anywhere, and followed the voiceless sentry down through a labyrinth of elevators, finally emerging into a long corridor. I strode down it, hearing my own steps echo. A second rhythm joined them imperceptibly and Gamine stole out of the darkness, swathed in a luminous veiling, creeping noiselessly as a ghost behind me. Later I became conscious of Everin's padding catsteps behind Gamine, trailing us single file. And other figures came from darkened recesses to stretch the silent parade. A slim girl in a winged cloak, flame color, a dwarfed man who walked beneath the amethyst huddle of purple cap and furs. Memory fitted names to them, but I did not speak to them or they to me. After a long time the immense corridor began to tilt upward, climbing toward a glimmer of light at the end. Without realizing it I had swung into an arrogant, loping stride. Now I brushed away the slave-soldier who headed the column and took the lead myself. Behind me the others fell into place as if I had bidden them. The flame-clothed girl in the winged cloak, the cat-footed Everin, the dwarf bent in his jester's cap, Gamine in the blue shroud. Without warning we came out into a vast court, an enclosed space, yet wide as the outdoors, 
a yard, a plaza, a place of imposing grandeur, a place of memory. The red sun above us glowed like a lurid coal. There were tall pillars on three sides of the courtyard, and at the far end a vaulted archway led into a tree-lined drive that stretched away for miles into the twilight. Between two pillars Karami waited, slim, shimmering golden from head to foot. A hungry impatience sparked in her cat's eyes. "'You're late!' "'I'm ready,' I said. What I was ready for, I was not sure. Karami waved an impatient signal to the Narabedlans who were coming up. "'Adric is with us again,' she said in her curious, lazy voice. "'Your allegiance to Adric, children of the rainbow!' I stood at her side, mute, waiting, a guard of silent men behind us. "'Lord Idris,' Karami summoned. The hunchback came to bow jerkily before us. "'Welcome home, Lord.' The girl in flame-color darted to where we stood and her dipping curtsy was like the waver of a moth toward a flame. "'Adric,' she murmured. The wings of her cloak lifted and fluttered across her shoulders as if they would fly of themselves. She was a shy thing, and her dark hair waved softly as if it too were winged. I touched her fingers lightly. But under the smolder of Karami's gaze I let her go. She watched me, shyly, with averted face. Everin's face was slyly malicious, but his voice was pure silk. "'It is pleasure to follow you again, my brother,' he almost purred, and I scowled at the mockery at his face and refused his offered hand. Only Gamin said nothing, coming forward on gliding feet to bow briefly and retire but the silver-sweet, sexless voice of the spell-singer murmured in a singing, almost wordless croon. "'Save your spells, Gamine,' said Karami savagely, and Everin jerked round at the shrouded form, but Gamine heeded neither of them, and the sweet contralto chanting went on. From somewhere the silent men brought horses. Horses, here in this nightmare world. I had never been on a horse in my life. I found myself vaulting, with a nice coordination of movement, into the saddle. The courtyard, for all the bustle of department, seemed to hold the silence of a grave. Karami kept me close to her. When we were all mounted, she threw the amber rod upward, and the last rays of the red sun caught its rays and sent a pure shaft of light down the darkened alleyway lined with trees. At the sight of that gleam a curiously familiar emotion stole through me. I threw up one arm over my head, mimicking Karami's gesture. "'Ride!' I shouted. And the flying steeds kept pace with mine. The driveway under the arch of trees led for miles under the thick boughs. Through the easy drumming of hooves I could still hear the sweet distant sound of Gammy singing, which floated on the wind, keeping pace with the rise and fall of the rolling road, in a quick cadence. The wind whipped Karami's golden hair like a halo about her head. I glanced over my shoulder to where the rainbow towers stood, now black, silhouetted against the great darkness of the mountains. Overhead, in the pink sky, the crescent of the tiny moon was brightening, and lower in the sky I saw another, wider disk, nearly at full. Cold air was stinging my cheeks and nipping my bones with frost, and I felt the spark struck from hooves beating on the frozen ground cold. Yet in Karami's garden flowers had glowed in tropical glory. And for a moment it was entirely Mike Kenscott, sick, bewildered, and panicky, who glanced about him with horror, feeling the swirling cold and a colder chill from the golden sorceress at my side. It was Mike Kenscott's will that jerked at the reins of the big gelding to end his farce now. "'What is it?' Karami cried over the noise of the hooves and I heard my own voice, raised above the galloping rhythm, cry back, Nothing! and call out a command to the horse. Good God! I was Mike Kenscott, but prisoner in a body that would not obey me, a mind that persisted in thoughts and habits I could not share, a soul that would carry me to destruction. I was Mike Kenscott, trapped on a nightmare ride through hell. End of chapter 4
Chapter Five of Falcons of Narabedla by Marion Zimmer Bradley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five, where the dreamer walks. I had been scared before. Now I was panicked, wild with a nerve-destroying fright. I am not a coward. I set up a radar transmitter in Okinawa within ninety feet of a nest of Japs, but that was something real. I could face it. But under two suns and a pair of little moons, with weird people I knew were not human, all right. I was a coward. I steadied myself in the saddle, trying with every scrap of my will to calm myself. If this was a nightmare, well, I'd had some beauties. But it wasn't. I knew that. The frost hurting my face, the sound of shod steel on stones, the vivid colors around me, told me I was wide awake. Dreams are not technicolored. And through all this I was riding hell for leather, my knees gripped on the saddle, guiding the horse with the grip of my thighs, and I'd never been on a horse's back in my life. Rode and rode. We had ridden about seven miles, and stopped twice to breed the horses, but we were still beneath the great archway of trees. The sky's pink sunset light had faded. The land was flooded with a blue, fluorescent starlight, a light I'd never seen before. I strained my eyes upward through the black foliage. I suppose I had some confused idea of guessing when I was by the stars, but the view to the north was hidden by mountains, and I don't know one constellation from another with that single exception. A glance at Karami in this fright unnerved me. I touched the reins, dropped back till I rode between Yamin and the girl in flame color. Adric. The spell-singer saluted coolly, and the girl in the winged cloak threw back her hood. I saw dark eyes watching me from a pure, sweet young face. Before the luminous innocence of those eyes I wanted to cry out in protest. I was not Adric, warlock of Narabedla. I was just a poor guy named Mike. I was just me. I rode beside Gamine for minutes, trying to think what I would say. Gamine's musical voice was not raised yet it carried perfectly to my ears. "'You seem wholly yourself again.' I didn't answer. What was there to say? Still there seemed to be sympathy in the sharp-edged tones. "'You will remember, perhaps too much, at the dreamer's keep.' "'Gamine,' I asked, "'who is Narayan? I saw the blue ropes quiver a little. Across from Gamine I saw a curious flickering look pass across the face of the girl in the orange-winged cloak, but Gamine's answer was perfectly even and disinterested. The name is not familiar to me. Have you heard it, Sinara? The girl did not answer, only moved her dark head a little. I should know, I mused. But the name Sinara had touched another of those live wires within my mind. Narain. Sinara. Sonara and Narayan. If I could only remember! Suddenly I turned. Gamine, who are you? Gamine sat quiet, eerily motionless on the tall horse. The robed figure seemed to blend into the starlit shadows around us. I had the sudden feeling of having relived this moment before, then the veiled shoulders twitched impatiently. Is this an inquisition? Rebuked and stung by the arrogant voice, I touched my heel to my horse's flank and rode forward to rejoin Karami. Gamine! The hell with Gamine! For several minutes the road had been climbing, and now we topped the summit of a little rise and abruptly the trees came to an end. By tacit consent we all drew our horses to a walk. We stood atop the lip of a broad bowl of land, perhaps thirty miles across, filled to the brim with thick, dark forest. Far out in this valley lay a cleared space, and in the center of that space lay a great tower, but not a slender and fairy-like spire like the towers of Rainbow City. This was a massive dungeon thrusting heavy shoulders upward into the moon-washed sky. The Keep of the Dreamers Something in me murmured, This is the forest where the dreamer walks, or had the murmured voice come from Gamine, motionless behind me. Karami rode eagerly, her face drawn tautly together, her slim tanned hands clenched on the reins. All this while I was Mike Kenscott, 
but a Mike who watched himself without knowing what he would do next, like those puzzling nightmares where a man is both actor and audience to some mummery being played. I watched myself say and do things as if I were two men at once. In effect, I suppose I was. Karamy turned in her saddle, facing me. Adric, she murmured, lead me where the dreamer walks. I knew, with a sudden surety, that because of some bond between the free dreamer and myself I could do this. But again, something outside myself told me what to say. That bond is broken, Karamy. Did you not break it yourself? How can I guide you then? And for my reward I saw unsureness leap in her cat's eyes. That shot had told. Karamy had been guessing then. The answer had shaken her. But this woman was a past mistress at subtlety. She murmured, It can be forged again, that I swear. Ah, but I knew how far to trust even Karamy's oaths. We had dipped down into the bowl of forest, and we were riding through thick woods, along a road that struggled windingly, with many curves and sharp corners. Adric knew this country. His knowledge made Mike Kenscott shiver. He had hunted here, and for no four-legged game. As if Karamy read my thoughts, I hear her low laughter. So my wrist aches for the feel of a falcon. We'll hunt here again, soon, you and I. I was partly bewildered by her words, but they gave me a shivering excitement, an insidious thrill. Behind me I heard Gamy's chanting take on a new note. The words were still indistinguishable, but the very tune screamed warning. A pulse began to twist jerkily in my neck. Without any warning the road twisted. Karamy and I spurred our horses and rounded the curve in one swift, racing burst of speed, and were fairly in the trap before we knew it. It was the agonized whinny of my horse, and the jolt of my body riding itself automatically from the plunging animal beneath me, that made me realize we had ridden straight on a show de vries. I yelled, cursing, shouting to carry me to get back, get back, but her own momentum carried her on. I saw her light body fly out of the saddle and disappear. The others, rounding the curve in a wild dash, were fairly on the barrier already, and the place was a bedlam, a scramble, with riderless horses milling in a melee of curses, and the screaming of women and the threshing of feet. I was out of my saddle in an instant thrusting Gamine's mount back from the stabbing points fixed invisibly against the dark barrier in the road, shouting to Everin and Idris. Everin leaped to my side, catching at Karamy's wild horse, while I tore madly at the barrier where the woman had been thrown. Idris bore down on me, mounted. "'Go round!' he shouted. I plunged through the underbrush at the side of the road, with hasty feet twice snaked by long creepers. Past the barrier the road lay open and deserted and Karamy lay in a shimmer of crumpled silk, motionless. "'Gamine! Everin!' I bellowed. "'No one's here! Quick! Karamy is hurt!' The head and shoulders of Idris' horse thrust through the thick brushwood. "'Is she dead?' the dwarf muttered. I bent, thrusting my hand to her breasts. Her heart's beating, only stunned. "'Get down!' I ordered. Idris scrambled, monkey-fashion, from the saddle. I lifted the woman in my arms, but she did not move or open her eyes. Idris touched my arm. "'Put her on the saddle,' he suggested, and together we laid her across the pommel. Suddenly the dwarf cried out. "'What?' I asked sharply. "'I hear—' I never knew what Idris heard. His head vanished, as if snatched away by a giant's hand. A rough grip collared me, choking fingers clawed at my throat. A thousand rockets went off in my head, and I lay sprawling in the brushwood, eating dust, with an elephant sitting on my chest and threatening hands gouging my throat. My last coherent thought before the breath went out of me was, I'm waking up. End of chapter 5「Chapter 6 of Falcons of Narabedla by Marion Zimmer Bradley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 6 Narayan But I wasn't. When I came to, it could only have been a few seconds that I was unconscious, 
it was to hear Everin snarling curses and Idris barking incoherently with rage. I heard Karami screaming my name and started to answer, but the steely fingers were still at my throat, and with that weight on top of me I hadn't a chance. The fall or something had knocked Adric clean out of me. I was fuzzy-brained but sane. I was an innocent bystander again. I could see Everin and Idris in the road, casting wary glances at the brushwood all around them. I could just make out the face of the man who was holding me pinned to the earth with his body. He had the general build of a hippopotamus, and a face to match. I squirmed, but the threatening face came closer and I subsided. The man could have broken me in two like a match. Around me in the thicket were dozens of crouching forms, fantastic snipers with weapons at their shoulders, weapons that could have been crossbows or disintegrators or both. Enter Buck Rogers, I thought wearily. I was beginning to feel faint again, and the old welterweight on my stomach didn't help any. Abruptly he moved, delicate fingers knotted a gag in my gasping mouth. Then the intolerable weight on my chest was suddenly gone, and I sucked in air with relief. The fat man eased himself cautiously up, and I felt a steel point caress my lowest rib. The threat didn't need words. I could see the Narabedlins gathered, a tight little knot in the road. The snipers around me were still holding their weapons, but the fat man commanded in a low voice, "'Don't fire. They're sure to have guards riding behind them.' The voice died to a rasping mutter, and I lay motionless, trying to dredge up some of Adric's memories that might help. But the only thing I got was a fleeting memory of my own football days and a flying tackle by a Penn State halfback that had knocked me ten feet. Adric was gone, clean gone. The Narabedlins were talking in low tones, gamine the rallying point from which they clustered. Everin had his sword out but even he did not step toward the mantling thicket. Sonara was holding Everin's arm, protesting wildly. No, 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 no! They'll kill Adric! Suddenly, between two breaths, the road was alive with mounted men. Who they were, I never knew. I was quickly dragged to my feet and jerked away. Behind me I heard shouting and steel, and saw thin flashes of colored flame. Spots of black danced before my eyes as I stumbled along between two captors. I felt my sword dragged from my scabbard. Oh, well, I thought wryly, now that Adric's run out on the party, I don't know how to use it anyway. Under the impetus of a knife I found myself clambering awkwardly into a saddle, felt the horse running beneath me. There wasn't a chance of getting away, and the frying pan couldn't be much worse than the fire anyway. Behind us the noises of battle died away. The horse I rode raced, sure-footed, into the darkness. I hung on with both hands to keep from falling. Only Adric's habitual reflexes kept me from tumbling ignominiously to the ground. I don't think I had any more coherent thoughts until the jolting rhythm broke and we came out of the forest into full moonlight and a glare of open fires. I raised my head and looked around me. We were in a grove tree-ringed, like a druid temple, lit by watch-fires and the waver of torches. Tents sprouted in the clearing, giving it an untidy, gypsy appearance. At the back was a white frame house with a flat roof and wide doors, but no windows. Men and women were coming out of the tents everywhere. The talk was a Pentecost of tongues, but I heard one name repeated over and over again. Narayan! Narayan! the shouts clamored. A slim young man, blonde, dressed in rough brown, came from one of the larger tents and walked deliberately toward me. The crowd drew back, widening to let him approach. Before he came within twenty yards he made a signal to one of the men to untie my gag and let me down. I stood, clinging to the saddle, exhausted. The young man came forward until he could almost have touched me, and studied my face dispassionately. At last he raised his head, turning to the fat man, my captor. "'This isn't Adric,' he said. "'This man is a stranger.' I should have been relieved. I don't know why I wasn't. Instead, my first reaction was bewilderment and angry annoyance. How could he tell that? 
I was as furiously embarrassed as if I'd been accused of wearing stolen clothing. My beefy captor was as angry as I was. "'What do you mean, this isn't Adric?' he demanded belligerently. "'We took him right out of their accursed cavalcade. If it isn't Adric, who is it?' "'I wish I knew,' Narayan muttered under his breath. His eyes, still fixed on my face, were level, disconcerting. He was tall and straightly built, with pale blond hair cut square around his shoulders, like a squire from a Provençal ballad, and gray eyes that looked grave but friendly. I liked his looks, but he had a trace of the uncanny stillness I'd noticed in old Rhys, in Gamine. For a moment, I decided to tell my whole fantastic story to this man with the grave eyes. He would surely believe it. But to my surprise, he spoke and called me Adric, definitely, as if he had forgotten his doubts. Adric, he said, do you still remember me? Or did Karami take that too? I sighed. I didn't dare tell the truth, and I felt too chilled and exhausted and disoriented to lie convincingly. Yet lie I must, and do it well." The fat man scowled and fronted Narayan. "'Karami! Zandru's eyelashes!' he growled. "'Look you! Did Brennan come back this afternoon? He knows his way around Rainbow City. Ask Adric what happened to Brennan!' The clamoring broke out around us again, but Narayan never took his eyes from my face as he answered gently, "'There is always danger, Rafe blame no man unjustly. Brennan knew he faced all the dangers of Rainbow City. And even Adric is not to blame if a she-witch has him under her spells. Traitor! Rafe snarled at me and spat. I loosed the saddle-horn and stepped dizzily forward. You might try asking me, I said with a weary anger. Are you Adric of the Crimson Tower? Fat Rafe snapped. I don't know," I said tiredly. I don't know, I don't know. Narayan's eyes met mine in skeptical puzzlement. Abruptly he put out one hand and took my wrists in a firm grip. We can't talk here, whoever you are, he said. Come along. He led me through the thinning crowd into the frame house at the grove's edge. Rafe and one other man trailed after us the rest clustering high-fashion around the door. Inside, in a great timbered room, a fire burned and glowing globes chased away darkness. I went gratefully toward the fire. I was stiff with writing and I felt chilled and stupid and empty with the cold. From a wood settle near the fire a woman rose. She was slight and dark and around her shoulders the luminescent shimmer of her winged cloak flowed like another flame. Sonara. Adric, she said half aloud, holding out her hands. I took them, partly because she seemed to expect it, partly because the girl seemed the only thing real in a world gone haywire. She flung her arms suddenly around my neck and held herself to me with a shy deliberation. Adric, 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 she begged. I slipped away in the dark. I suppose Gammy knows. But they'll never find me here, no, never." Narayan's hand pulled the girl sternly away from me. She shrank before the annoyance in his eyes. "'Please, Narayan, no!' The blond man looked at her without speaking for long moments. At last he said gravely, "'Sister, you must go back to Narabedla. I would not make you go if there was another way. But you must for a time.' He beckoned to one of the men. Carol, he commanded, take Sonara back to Rainbow City, but don't get caught. Sonara, tell them you were lost in the woods, or that you were caught and escaped." The childish mouth trembled, and she turned to me appealingly, but I gave a little shrug. What was I supposed to do? Narayan gave Sonara a gentle push. "'Go with Carol, little sister,' he ordered in a quiet voice. Carol took her arm and they hurried out of the room the winged cloak she wore fluttering on her shoulders. Narayan motioned to Rafe to follow them through the door. I'll talk with him alone. Rafe's thick lips set stubbornly. He looked as if he'd be nasty in a fight. If he's Adric, 
and if he's under Karami's devilments, then—' "'I have faced Adric, and Karami too,' said Narayan, with a friendly grin at the man. "'Get out, Rafe. You're not my bodyguard, or even my nurse.' The fat man accepted dismissal reluctantly, and Narayan came to my side. There was real friendliness in his grin. "'Well,' he said, "'now we will talk. You cannot kill me any more than I could kill you, so we may as well be truthful with each other. Why did you leave us, Adric? What has Karami done to you this time?' The room reeled around me. I put out a hand to steady myself. When the dizziness cleared, Narayan's arm was around my shoulders, and he was holding me up with a strength surprising in his slight frame. He let me settle down on the seat Sinara had left. "'You have been roughly handled,' he said in apology. "'Just sit a minute. My men,' he made a deprecating little gesture, "'have had orders. And if I know Karami's ways, you've been heavily drugged for a long time.' His eyes studied me intently. "'Better come and have a drink. And when did you eat last? You look half-starved. That's the way of the Sherig. I rubbed my forehead. "'I can't remember,' I told him honestly. "'I thought so. Come along.' Narayan went into the next room, assuming that I would follow and that I knew my way around. After the insanely furnished rooms in Rainbow City, I was a little surprised when the next room proved to be a strictly functional and ordinary kitchen, equipped with the usual items. Out of a relatively unextraordinary icebox he assembled something that looked rather like the food I was accustomed to from the twentieth century, and poured some kind of liquid into an oddly shaped glass. He motioned me into a chair and set the things on the table. Here, eat this. I know the drugs they give you. You'll have more sense when you've eaten. We've plenty of time to talk, all night if we choose." He saw me glance sidewise at the glass, laughed sketchily, and from the same bottle poured himself a drink and sat down opposite me, sipping it slowly. "'Go ahead. I won't poison you till I find out what Karami's up to.' I laughed apologetically and started eating, with a mental shrug. It had been at least forty-eight hours since I had last tasted food, and I did justice to the plateful before me. Narayan sipped his drink, which, when I tasted mine, appeared to be excellent cognac, and watched me. And when I finally pushed the empty plate aside, he put back his glass and said, "'Now, who are you, and what happened?' I felt better and stronger more like myself than I'd felt since Reese had catapulted me into this world. But now that I was on the carpet, I felt I must talk fast and convincingly before those searching gray eyes. Karami had shut me in the tower, I told him. I was freed today, and we were on our way to the Dreamer's Keep. Then your men came along. I didn't know if I was being rescued or captured. I still don't. I stared with purposeful blankness at Narayan. He stared back, and I could feel him debating what to do and say. Obviously, an Adric sane and glib and possibly untruthful was a different thing than an Adric too bewildered and shaken to tell anything but the truth. Finally Narayan said, "'I'm not sure what I ought to do or say, Adric. The bond between us isn't as strong as it was. You know that.' I nodded, perturbed. Adric's thoughts seemed to be surging back, insidiously, as if Narayan held the key to unlock them. What crazy drama was going to be unfolded in my mind now? Narayan said, low, Karami did it, I think. Yes. My own voice was as quiet as his own. Karami sent me on the time ellipse. She knew I'd come back changed or mad, or not at all. I think, I think she wanted me to betray you again." "'Adric!' Narayan reached out quickly and grabbed my arm, hard above the elbow, till I cried out with the pain of that steely grip and twisted away, rubbing numbed flesh. "'Adric!' Narayan repeated unsteadily. "'Why do you say, betray me again? Betray me? Adric!' 
It was your hand that freed me. Zendru! Adric, he begged, how much have you forgotten? End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of Falcons of Narabedla by Marion Zimmer Bradley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seven: Battle in My Brain. The fire in the other room had burned down to an ember. Without a glance my way, Narayan mended the fire, sat down, his legs stretched toward the little blaze, his chin in his hands, waiting. I could not stand still. I walked, restless, around the room, speaking in little jerks and half-sentences. "'You are the dreamer,' I said. "'I... I remember a little. I remember being bound to you. I remem remember when I... freed you. Not knowing what it might mean. Not knowing you could have slain me on the ground of sacrifice.' "'No,' Narayan was as motionless as Gamine's veils but his voice was harsh, strident. No, Adric, never that. We cannot kill each other, you and I. I could order you killed, I suppose, but I... I would never do that unless there was no other way. Adric, is there any other way for me, for you?" A bitterness spoke in my voice. Neither side trusted Adric. Both wanted his allegiance. I tried to trim my words carefully between the two personalities that were battling for mastery in me. "'It was Karami, I said, who took Adric from you and sent him, half mad, back to the Crimson Tower. Karami's magic stripped him of power and sent him, gone mad, back to stargazing in Narabedna. But it was not Karami's. The voice that was not quite mine shook, suddenly, with my own weariness, and the blank terror I'd been keeping at bay. It was not Karami who sent me here. I'm not Adric. You are perfectly right. I'm no more Adric than... than you are. I'm in Adric's body, yes. He moves me like a puppet. I have his memories, his... some of his thoughts. But he... My voice cracked suddenly on a note of panic. I knew I sounded like a hysterical kid, but I couldn't stop my own crack-up once it had broken loose. I'm not Adric. I'm not. I don't belong here at all. I don't. Narayan jumped up from the bench and I heard his hurrying steps. Then his steel hands were hard upon my shoulders, swinging me round to face him. All right, he said. Steady. It's all right. I drew a long breath and let it out again. "'Thanks,' I said briefly, shamed. "'I'll be all right now.' Narayan shrugged wearily. "'It's all right. I guessed you weren't Adric, of course, from the beginning. But I didn't think Adric, when it came to the test, would really do that to me. I had his promise. I suppose, for him, it was an easy way out. A perfect way of escape.' He sank down on the bench again, dropping his head in his hands. After a little he looked up, and his voice sounded tired. "'This is difficult,' he said. "'My men think you are Adric. I'd never be able to convince them you aren't. Would you mind pretending? You'll have to. Otherwise—' He paused, and I saw disquiet in his face. He was not a man who would enjoy threatening but I could understand his situation. They didn't know me from Adam. I was just an outsider who messed things up by resembling Adric. Well, I was stuck. I hadn't liked the Narabedlans enough to give a hang what Narayan meant to do to them. Narayan, by comparison, looked pretty decent. And there was no other way to save my skin. Adric wasn't too popular, it seemed, and in Adric's body I hadn't a chance. I laughed. I'll try, I told him, but what's this all about? Narayan looked up again. That's right, you wouldn't know. You have some of Adric's memory, I suppose, but not all. You remember who I am? Not entirely, 
I told him. I remembered some things. Narayan had been born, some thirty years ago, into a respectable country family who were appalled to discover they had given birth to a mutant dreamer, and were only too glad to deliver him to the Narabedlans for the enforced stasis. I told Narayan. You remember the old dreamer who served your house? I nodded. He had become old, mortal, weak, and had been eliminated. I bowed my head, although I had no personal guilt. Afterward, Narayan and I had been bound. I slept in the dreamer's keep. Narayan sounded reflective, almost guilty. I was wakened, and given sacrifice. I learned to use my power and to give it up to Adric. A brooding horror was in the gray eyes. I realized that Narayan dwelt in his own personal private hell with the memory of what he had done under the spell of Narabedla. Adric was strong. Yes, I thought. Adric had called on Narayan's new power without counting cost. What wonder the memory maddened Narayan! The young dreamer seemed to win his silent fight for self-control. Well, you, Adric, I mean, freed me. I found my sister again, Sanara. I was like a child. I had to learn to live, to be alive again. I had been trained to use my power only through the sacrifice. I had to learn to use it without. It wasn't easy." Why? I asked, thoughtlessly. Narayan's eyes froze me. To use that power, he said in a tense, controlled voice, took human life. Outside the door I could hear the noises of the camp. The light of their watchfires crept in through the cracks. It was too dark to see Narayan's face now, but I heard him moving restlessly about the room. I have harnessed the power somewhat, he said. I can use it myself a little. Not much. Adric helped me. So did my sister. She had been taken for sacrifice, but you, Adric, redeemed her. Then we were able to throw an illusion around Sonara. She is not of Narabedla, but we made it seem as if she had always been there in Rainbow City. We could do that because Everin is weak, and because Karami did not care. It was Reese who made the illusion. Reese, The old dreamer, the only one born in Narabedla. Yes, Gamine is careless with Reese and lets him wake too long. Reese and I have been in contact for a long time. I was hearing scraps of conversation from a vast abyss of time and space, when I had been drawn in electric coma through Karami's time ellipse. They will know. Narayan will know. That had been old Reese, and Adric. What have I to do with Narayan? Adric had been, still was, playing a fancy double game with Narayan. I started to open my lips to tell the young dreamer about it, but he was still talking. Reese will not act, not directly against Rainbow City. But he did that much for us, and Gamine and Sonara are friends. We forgot we all forgot that Adric's allegiance belonged to Narabedla first, until he vanished. I heard the brooding heaviness in Narayan's voice. These men had been friends. Narayan went on. I sent Brennan today to find out. He didn't come back. I lowered my head and miserably told him what had happened to Brennan. Narayan's face in a flicker of firelight looked drawn and haggard. He was a brave man, Narayan said at last. But I don't blame you. After the interchange, I think, there was a time when you went on living Adric's life, thinking his thoughts. But now, I think, he will grow weaker in you, I hope. You, who are you, in your own world? I shrugged. The words would have meant nothing to Narayan. My name's Mike Kenscott. Mayek, Narayan repeated, turning the strange word on his tongue. The men will call you Adric. I'd better too. Later, he shrugged, I didn't say anything. 
I was still convinced that I hadn't seen the last of Adric. But I didn't want to tell Narayan this. I liked the man. Without warning, Narayan switched on lights. It's near dawn, and you must be worn out. We've taught them to stay clear of the forests at night, so we're safe enough here. They can't do much till they've been to the Dreamer's Keep in any case. With a sudden boyish friendliness, he put out his hand and I took it. I'm glad you're not Adric. He might be hard to handle now, if he's changed so much. As if the lights had been a signal, Fat Rafe came without knocking into the room. Narain crossed his hostile stare at me. He's all right, Rafe, the dreamer said. The fat face broke into a sudden, elephantine smile. I'd better apologize, Adric. I had orders. Find him a place to sleep, Narain suggested, and I followed Rafe up a flight of low stairs into an inner room. There was a bed there, clean but tumbled, as if it had had another occupant not long ago. Rafe said, Carol's gone with Sonara. You can sleep here. I kicked off my boots and crawled between the blankets, suddenly too weary even to answer. I had been two days without sleep, and most of that time I had been under exhausting physical and mental strain. I saw Rafe cautiously finger his weapons and sensed that, whatever Narayan said, he was reserving judgment. He didn't take chances, this outside lieutenant of Narayan's. Sleepily, I said, you can put that up, my friend. I'm not going to move till I've had a good, long... I didn't even finish the sentence to myself. Instead, I went to sleep. I had slept for hours. I came abruptly out of confused dreams to hear a shrill voice and to feel small hands pulling me upright. Sonara. Wake up, Adric, she wailed. Carry me and Everin are riding today, hunting you. I sat up, dizzy-brained, far from alert. Sonara! How? Oh, never mind that! Her voice was impatient. What can we do? I didn't know. I was still stupid with sleep, but I put a reassuring arm around her shoulders. Don't be afraid, I told her, then, releasing her, bent and began to pull on my boots. I heard the swift pound of steps on the stairs, and Narayan shoved open the door dragging a brown tunic over his head as he came. He stopped short at the door, staring at his sister. "'Sonara, what are you doing here?' She repeated her news, and he sighed. He looked as if he hadn't slept at all. "'Well, never mind,' he told her. The game was almost over anyhow. Sooner or later they would have broken through the illusion. Reese is too old now for that. You were lucky to get away.' We'll have to storm the keep tonight, unless they have too good hunting." He fumbled with the laces of his shirt. A dead weariness was in his gray eyes. They looked flat, almost glazed. He met my questioning stare and smiled ruefully. "'The dreamers stir,' he told me. "'I am not yet free of their need. So I must be careful. Sonera shuddered and threw her arms around her brother's neck, clutching him with a fiercely sheltering clasp. Narayan, no! Oh, no! Don't!" But he was already deep in thought again. He freed her arms without impatience. "'We'll meet that when the time comes, little sister. So, Karami and Everin ride hunting. Who else? Idris?' At her nod, his brows contracted. "'All of them. But Gamine, he mused and turned to me. Could you conceivably get through to Reese? I don't dare, not with that, that stirring. I understood. Narayan was still attuned to the terrible need of the sleeping dreamers in the keep. But I reminded him that only Gamine could control old Reese. He looked at me with a strange, curious question in his eyes, but made no comment. My own mind was working strong. I was unsure how I had gotten here in the house of the free dreamer, just what had happened last night. I had thought Narayan would never trust me again, but now, when I needed it most, I seemed to be in his complete confidence. Damn care me anyhow, meddling with my memory. 
and she had the audacity to fly Everin's devil birds after me. Adric, lord of the Crimson Tower. She should have a lesson she would not forget, and so should the presumptuous Gamine. And so should this walking zombie who was staring at me stupidly, as if I were his equal. I said with a slow savagery, I think I can manage Gamine. Narayan was watching me anxiously. Gods of the rainbow, what preposterous things had I said and done last night? I said, We'll take them at the dreamer's keep, and saw his face clear. But what you do not know, Narayan, I added to myself with a secret satisfaction, is that you will join them there. It never occurred to them to question, to wonder if Adric today were the Adric of last night. We went downstairs and snatched a quick breakfast. Sonara tore off her winged flame-colored cloak and stuffed it wrathfully into the fireplace. Her coarse gray dress beneath it made her shy prettiness more striking than ever. Sonara was not Karami, but she was a pretty thing. And Narayan could hardly fail to trust me when Sonara perched on the arm of my chair and ran her dainty fingers over the bruises on my face. "'Your roughs nearly killed him!' she pouted at her brother. Oh, I'm not hurt. I smiled at her, making my voice gentle for her ear alone. But I scowled darkly into my plate, pushed the food away, and strode out into the camp. Narayan shouted quickly, jumping up, sending his chair crashing to the floor, and he ran after me so that we went down the steps together. Wait, he commanded in my ear softly. Don't forget, to them you're still a traitor. He took my arm and we walked through every row of tents together, Narayan's expression almost belligerent. I saw the faces of the men as they came from their improvised shelter, saw suspicion gradually give way to tolerance, and then casual acceptance. Finally Narayan called to Rafe. Stick to him, will you, Rafe? He's all right, but the men don't know it yet. I glanced at Narayan. Rafe, I said tentatively. Can you find me twelve men who know the way to Rainbow City and aren't afraid to come close to it?" "'I can,' Rafe said, and went to do it. I had to hide a smile. Before long I would win back the place my foolishness had lost. The idiot whose body I had shared briefly had almost put it beyond recovery, but in a way he had helped, too. His weakness had won Narayan's confidence. Well, one thing I knew that futile idiot should not share the coming triumph, nor should Narayan. Narayan, fumbling in my pocket, I touched something smooth and hard. Everin's mirror. Narayan, looking over my shoulder as I dragged it out, asked curiously, What's that? I pulled it out with a secret smile. One of Everin's toys. Look at it if you like. Narayan took it in his hand for a moment, without, however, untwisting the silk. "'Go ahead,' I urged. "'Unwrap it.' I might have sounded too eager. Abruptly Narayan handed it back. "'Here. I don't know anything about Everin.' I had to conceal my disappointment. With a feigned indifference I thrust it back into the pocket. It did not matter. One way or another Narayan would lose for Everin and Karami rode a-hunting today, and I knew what their game would be. End of chapter 7